Good morning, everyone. My name is Eric. I am the youth pastor here at Aspire Church, and I just wanted to say welcome. We're so excited, so happy that you decided to join us today. If this is your first time on your seat, you will see a little connection card. If you would be willing to fill out your information on this and take it to the next steps table, and we ask you to do this because we want to get to know you. If you're here for the first time coming to check us out, you want to find out a little bit more about us, well, we'd like to find out a little bit more about you as well. Get to know you, and if you have any prayer requests, please put that on there. And that goes for all of, the, all of you that have been here more than once, too. You're always welcome to put your prayer requests on here and take it to the next steps table. Because this allows us to kind of know what's going on in your life. Sometimes life gets busy and we don't get a chance to, to hear what's going on in your life. And this, this allows us to come alongside you and pray with you. And it, but if this is your first time and you take this to the next steps table, we have a gift for you. A little gift bag and you, good stuff inside. You don't want to pass up that opportunity. So make sure you take this to the next steps table. Also wanted to mention that on your chair is an offering envelope, and this is one way that you can give. If you fill out the offering envelope, we have a basket in the back you can put it in. You can go online and pay your uh, tithes and offerings that way, or you can also text seven, uh, Spire Church to 77977. One thing we do want to point out, though, is I don't know how many of you have heard about the fire in Maui, but it's considered one of the most devastating fires in history in American history in that area right now. It's already killed over 90 people, and it's still, the devastation in the lives and the homes of people there is, it's, it's horrible. And so what we want to do is we want to give an opportunity to you. We, we know you guys are generous all the time in everything that we've done. We want to give an opportunity as a church to, to give to that, to, to the churches that have boots on the ground. And so if you, on your envelope, if you want to give to Maui, Go ahead and write Maui on it. Same thing online, or there's a drop-down uh, tab on the, the mobile text giving for Maui. If you give to this, 100% of what you donate for that will go to churches in the area that are literally helping people that are there. And speaking of which, um, I'm going to ask Brian to come up because he, he wanted to pray, but we want to also pray for Maui. In a moment, we're going to just uh, spend some time praying for Maui. But before that, I want to put up a, a psalm. We just got through our series in Psalms. So let's continue to stay in that rhythm of Psalms. And Psalms 9, 1 and 2. And I read this today, and I thought we would just pray this psalm together today. I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart. I will recount all of your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and exalt you in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. That phrase, I will give thanks to the Lord. Hey, let's just bow our heads for a moment. And here's what I want you to do. Out loud, I want you to give thanks to the Lord. You just simply say, God, I thank you for, and just fill in the blank. And I'm wondering if you'd be so bold, maybe even stand up where you are. Just stand up. You don't have to. But boy, when you stand up, sometimes you can talk a little bit louder. We can hear you. Just stand up where you are. What do you give thanks for right now? Just stand up. Don't be shy. Thank you. Anybody else? Stand up. Just speak it out. If you're seated, speak it out loud. What do you give thanks for? Go ahead. Just speak it out loud. Give thanks to the Lord. Anybody here thankful for their family? Anybody? Say it. Give thanks to the Lord. I thank God for my family. Say it out loud. Anybody thankful you have some money? You have a little bit of money. I give thanks to the Lord. Thank you, God, for providing. Say it out. Then it says, I recount all your wonderful deeds. I don't know about you, but maybe... God has been working in your life as he is in my life. 
Maybe he has done something incredible in your life. Maybe God has moved in the life of a child or moved in, in your life as a, in a marriage. Or maybe God has moved in your life in something going on in, in your small group at church. However God has worked, here's what I'd like you to do. Just say it out loud to God. Just say, God, thank you for, and just finish the sentence. Go ahead, wherever you are. You can do it at the same time as well. It's okay. Just speak out loud and thank God for what he's done. if you'd look at me. It may have been awkward for you at first to do that, but I'll tell you what we do sometimes at church. We sometimes pray, and we do it on a regular basis, but sometimes if you go to church, and this happens at our church as well as other churches I've visited, sometimes prayer is to move the podium here and get the podium off or move people around. And God says, I want you to stop and pray. I want you to stop and pray. If you come to church and you don't know Christ, wouldn't you expect the church to pray? Wouldn't you? Wouldn't you expect the people of God to pray? When something like this happens in Maui, I think it is good for us to pause and to pray for those that are, that are suffering in Maui. And let's just spend some time right now lifting up people of Maui. Would you pray right now? For those that are still fighting the fire, would you just lift up the firefighters and police and responders? Would you do that right now? Doctors, nurses, go ahead and pray out loud where you are. Now, would you pray for families that have lost everything? lost their home, they've lost their cars, they've lost their clothing. Many people have lost loved ones. Would you pray for them right now? Go ahead, all over. Just pray for them right now. Dear Father, we lift up those in Maui. Lord, we pray for them. We meet with them right now. Holy Spirit, we join with them and we, we lift them up at their point of need, Lord. And we pray that you will meet them at that point of need, Lord. Would you minister to them? Would you help them? Would you give them strength? Would you give them provision? Lord, we pray for the church on the ground. Lord, would you allow them to come around these people? And even in the midst of a bad time, would you turn this around for good and bring glory to yourself as the church meets those needs where they are, Lord? Thank you, God, that we can pray here in Tucson, Arizona and reach out to people in Maui. Reach out to people in Ukraine. Last year, reaching out to people that were uh, flooded in Kentucky and other places, Lord. Holy Spirit, you can move in our prayers and you do move in the prayers of your people. And Lord, we also thank you that we join together with the church that are on the ground. Lord, we lift them up to you. Thank you that we are part of an amazing army called your church. Thank you for calling us to be a part of, of you, Lord. Lord, as we continue this series, The Life of a Jesus Follower, would you open our hearts to what you want to show us today, Lord? And as we worship you right now, may the focus just be on you. As we leave everything behind that we have brought into this room that can distract us, and may our attention be on you, Lord. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Hey, let's worship God. Hey, go ahead and have a seat. If you do not have a Bible, we have some Bibles on the, the sides here, and you can get up and, and grab one, and uh, we're going to turn the lights on so you can read that. And if you would, turn with me to John 15. We're in our series, The Life of a Jesus Follower, and we, um, in a good way, kind of got stuck here in John 15. That's not a bad place to be stuck, and it's, it's great. That's where God has us. Uh, I've had an incredible week meeting with... Um, some leaders uh, that gathered together in Atlanta, and it was, it was great. 
And I was coming back on um, uh, Thursday, and you know, after a great week, so I was filled up. I was excited and everything. I had my luggage, and I like to travel with my luggage. Does anybody not like to part with your luggage? Anybody like that? Anybody? A couple of you? I just don't like that. And, they, and I hear that it's full. The flight's full. We're going to ask that you check your bags. I mean, my bag's like, it's just really small. And so I don't want to check my bag. And so they, they take my bag, and, they, and I said, listen, I really do need my bag. You know, there's, I mean, there's stuff in there I need, you know, underwear and stuff like that, right? You know, we need it. And so uh, I get to Dallas, and I find out that my connecting flight is canceled, and uh, mechanical issues, and um, so they put me on a uh, flight to Phoenix, and then I get to Phoenix, and um, then I get to, you know, I have to fly now to Tucson, so I have to wait four and a half hours. I can almost walk to Tucson, you know, and so they tell me that um, that there's a flight at 5:25 if you want to get on that. So I, I go and have about 50 minutes till that flight, and they say that it has to be an hour because of my bag. You see, yeah, you feel me, right? Like that's like I want my bag, I can't do it. So they say they have to wait four and a half hours because my bag is on that. That flight. So now I'm checking where my bag is. You ever had that app, you know, where you check where your bag is? I want to know where my bag is. So it's, it's in Dallas somewhere. And so uh, I get to Tucson on that later flight. And guess what's not? My bag. Not there. They said it'll be there tonight, midnight. I, I got up in the middle of the night, check out, see if that bag is there. Guess what? Bag's not there. It doesn't show up till late the next day. It's okay. But when I got to the baggage claim, and I'm just confessing to you, right? Me and you, I didn't say the nicest of things, okay? And so I wanted to tell you that before the sermon so we can now move forward. I feel better now. Good. Let's move forward. But today I want to talk to you about loving one another because sometimes we have enough energy and enough love within us to love all the good people at the right time, right? But then when It's the wrong people that really, you know, aggravate you at the wrong time. And your your love tank is low. You ever heard that phrase, love tank? I can't find that scripture in here, but I've read that book. And my love tank was low on Thursday night. So some words came out of my mouth. No cuss words. Just things that shouldn't be said from a pastor. Or any Jesus follower, for that matter, right? So I just... Just throwing that out there. And my tank was a little bit low, right? Somewhere between DFW and Phoenix got a little low. And so we've been learning that the life of Christ comes from within us. When we love people, it's an overflow of the life of Christ. Last week, we looked at a passage that was really some lessons from the vineyard from Jesus himself, and Jesus is headed to the cross, and he gathers his disciples up, and he gives this last bit of information before he goes, and he tells them to abide. He says, your hope in life is to stay connected to me. You're the branch, he said, I'm the vine. He talks about the vine dress for the Father, but he He tells them this one word. He says, abide. And he says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Doesn't say something, nothing. So if you are apart from him, that life that comes from him is not only just a little empty, you can't do anything. And so we said that the definition of fruit, which is really the the proof that we are Jesus followers, The fruit that comes out, see, the branch has fruit that's on the branch, but the branch, I have never known a branch to produce fruit. Branches don't produce fruit. You know what produces fruit? The life of the vine. The branch just stays there, and the fruit comes out. So that's the life of the vine. So our goal, our job is to abide. And the definition of fruit, we said last week, was the life of Jesus in me being lived through me. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's a lot of background. I wanted to give some background to you because we spent about 40 minutes talking about that, and some of you weren't here last week, and I just wanted to give you kind of a a rehash of that. 
And we come to John 15, 8 and 10, 8 through 10, and we looked at this last week. What does this fruit look like? Because if that's the proof of what I am, what, who I am in Christ, what's the proof of that? What does it look like? What is this fruit about? We said there were really two last week, and we're going to look at one this week. And we find it in John 15, 8 through 10. It says, by this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit. How much fruit? Much fruit. It says a lot of fruit. And so prove to be my disciple. So the, the fruit proves that I'm a disciple. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So last week, we said the first practical aspect of a fruitful life is this. A fruitful life is a close and personal life. A fruitful life is a close and personal life. To who? To Jesus. It's more than a quiet time, but it includes a quiet time. It includes time with Jesus. It includes hearing his voice and doing what he tells us to do. So a fruitful life is a close and personal life. Also, Jesus tells us in John 14, he says, if you love me, if you have this relationship, you will obey me. So if you love me, you're going to obey me. So a fruitful life is a life of obedience. So when you look at your life, do people say, that is somebody that spends time with Jesus? And that is somebody that obeys Jesus. Now there's a little segment of that Thursday night where I think if somebody was observing me for the first time, they wouldn't get that. You ever have that? You're on the street, somebody cuts you off and Five o'clock on going down Speedway. Why they called it Speedway, I'll never know. But sometimes that life of Christ doesn't come up. I'm not saying that you don't have times of sin and disobedience. That's not what I'm saying. But your lifestyle, when people look at you, they say, yeah, they're not perfect. But I see them spending a lot of time with Jesus. And their life is obedient. There's a third thing I want to talk to you today. And Jesus does it. He just goes right into it in John 15, 12. Actually, let's look at John 15, 10 first. A fruitful life is a life of obedience, but a fruitful life also is a life of loving one another. John 15, 10 10 says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. And then Jesus literally gives them another command. He says this, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. I'm just going to stop right there because I want, I want you to just put a little asterisk there. If you write in your Bible, it's, you can write this. If not, don't worry about it. Just make it in a note. This is before he goes to the cross. So if I was to ask you, how did he love them? Many of us would say, well, he died for him. That's true, but he's not to the cross yet. So he has shown them what love is all about up until this point. He says, this is what I want you to do. I want you to love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I've called you friends. For all that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you, so that you will love one another. There's a lot that we can unpack in that passage, but I just want to look at three words here, love one another, love one another. This term is used to describe the life of Jesus lived out in community. That term one another is really talking about the inner circle of those that are Jesus followers, the family of God. When you see one another in scripture, that's what it's talking about. And there are over 60 mentions of one another in the New Testament. And there, are, there is one that stands out among them all, and that is 
love one another. But there are many others. Forgive one another. Be patient with one another. Encourage one another. And I just want to tell you, none of these can happen without the life of Christ. Let me ask you. You don't have to raise your hand. You don't have to tell me who it is. But do you have someone in your life that just did you wrong? That did something against you? Maybe, maybe it was in your family. Maybe it was in the church. Maybe whatever it was. You ever had somebody that's it's hard to forgive them? Yeah. I just want to tell you, forgiving those people and loving those people cannot be done in your own strength. It has to come from Christ. And Christ allows us to do that. Because when I say love one another, some of you go right to the person that you hate. And Jesus says, I want you to love one another. He even goes so far as to say, love your enemies. Do you know, we're the only religion, we're not a religion, but we're the only grouping that does that. You know, if you go to a synagogue today, they're not going to talk about loving your enemies. If you go to a mosque today, they're not going to say, hey, guys, we're going to talk today about how we love our enemies. Only Christians do that, and get this, only Christians can do that because of the love of Christ within us. It sets us apart from all others. Love one another. You know, I had this really, this experience this week of loving one another, and uh, I was the recipient of it. When I came home from the airport, didn't have my luggage, I walked in the house, and I saw that the toilet was stopped up. It's always a good thing to come home to. I'm like, okay, I got to use that. And so I'm going to go ahead and I got the plunger, and I turned the water on. Why was the water off? Because my wife is smart enough that when it stops up, she turns it off. Put her hand. It's awesome. That's what you're supposed to do. She did the right thing. So I'm going to turn it on and get some pressure there, and I'm not going to go into detail about it. But, and I turned it on, and the top of the valve shot off. And you know what happens when a valve comes off? Water comes out. Within two minutes, that bathroom is full. Now, I'm, my, my love tank is already low, right? And now, my bathroom is full of water. It's clean water, but it's water nonetheless. Within three, four minutes, the, the, the master bedroom now is, is getting flooded, and I'm panicking, and I'm like, where's the shutoff valve? Where's the shutoff valve? It's outside. So I go to the other end of the house, and I turn the shutoff valve, come back in, water's still, still flowing. Jessica's now awake. My daughter's now awake, master <laughs> bedroom is full of water, and I finally, long story short, finally find the shutoff valve. When you're panicking and it's raining outside, it's hard to find the shutoff valve, I'm just telling you. I'm shutting off everything, and I'm still turning things back on today that I shut off a few days ago. So what do you do? I, I called Rob. Why'd I call Rob? Because Rob has a has a shop back. How did I know that? Because Rob has everything. You need something, Rob has it. And he's like, I got one. I'll bring it on over. And it was the biggest shop back I've ever seen. I mean, it's just it's huge. Barely got in the door. And then I called Daniel Hunter. Why did I call Daniel? Because he can plumb things, right? So he came over. So Rob came over. We got that thing cleaned up. Not we, me. But you gave me the shop back. Cleaned it up. Daniel came over the next morning at 8 a.m., fixed the toilet. Water's back on. Uh, <laughs> you can pray for us. My wife is not here today. Been a long weekend. Been a long weekend. But you know what? Why do I say that? When I lean into this loving one another, before we get to talking about small groups and talking about community with the church, before we, I just want to tell you, sometimes what you need in the middle of the night is not to attend a small group. You need a shop back. Now, by the way, we'd been in small groups together. How did I know Rob would do that? I didn't ask Rob for a shop back. I said, I need your shop back. You can only do that with family. Right? Daniel, I need help. I need you to come over and help me. He didn't do it because I was his pastor. He did it because he loves me. He did it because he's family. So Rob came over because he's family. Daniel came over because he's family. They, they love us. We love one another. This term love 
is not a feeling. When I was a young teen, seventh grade, I had a crush on a girl in seventh grade. Her name was Diane. And Diane really thought she was the best thing in the world. My voice was changing in about sixth, seventh grade from soprano to baritone. Hadn't quite got there yet. And there were a lot of other changes, but we won't go back to sixth grade PE or health class to tell you all the changes. But I was starting to like girls. I'd kind of liked, liked them since fifth grade, but actually they were starting to take interest in me, probably because I was no longer a soprano. And Diane liked me, and I liked her, and we held hands. And when we held hands at church one day, a feeling that I had. Guys, you remember that feeling? Girls, I don't know what that feeling is for you, but like for me, the world just stopped. I loved Diane. I thought about her all the time. I went home and wrote notes to her, folded them up in a little triangle, put her name on it, a little heart, and she did the same. And we'd hand each other, and we'd, this is before texting, you'd, you'd bring your text, and you'd exchange your text at church, and I loved her, she loved me, and I don't know what happened with that relationship, I really don't. I don't remember where, where Diane ended up and, and all that, I, I wish her well. Those feelings went away, But isn't it interesting how we sometimes determine our love for people based on feelings? Almost as premature as that seventh grade relationship I had with Diane. I've heard people in my office and talking to people, and you meet at Starbucks, you're talking about their, their marriage, and I've, I've actually heard people say these words, I fell out of love with them. What they say is, I fell out of feelings, and that feeling similar to my seventh grade feeling, happened to somebody else. And that's what happens. And this is not the love we're talking about here. This is a different kind of love. When Jesus says, love one another, he's not saying feelings. He's saying, give your entire life with nothing in return. You're going to be selfless to this person. And I'm going to show you in a little while what that looks like. He's going to hang on a cross. He's going to love people. He's going to die for people in your family and mine, that will never turn to Jesus. He will die for people that use his name in vain. He will die for people that give him nothing in return. He says, I want you to love one another as I've loved you. Now, there was a whole assortment of things they could choose from to show the love, the hanging out, the laughing together, the, <laughs> the him taking a basin and washing their feet, so many things. But then the cross solidifies it for them. Love one another. This agape love. Love one another is, is an overflow of the life of Jesus. But also, loving one another is the result of a new identity. Jesus says, you're no longer, I'm going to call you servants, for the servant does not know what the master is doing, but I have called you friends. This is right after he actually washes their feet I've called you friends for all that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. Jesus calls his disciples to love one another. He calls them to a new identity, no longer a servant but a friend, no longer Jews and Gentiles but one in Christ, no longer slaves and free but one in Christ. They were once orphans, but now they are sons and daughters. Just to kind of give you an overview of these metaphors he uses to describe us. He calls us the family of God in Ephesians 3. He calls us the body of Christ in 1 Corinthians. He calls us the temple of the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians 6, 19. He calls us living stones in 1 Peter 2, 4. He goes on in that same passage to talk about the house of God, the house that he's building with us. All these identities, and here's the thing that they all have in common. None of these, none of these represent an individual life of following Jesus. It all is together. I've heard people, and it sounds very spiritual, I, I love God, and I have a great relationship with God, but I don't have a relationship with the church. I don't, I'm not much for the church. There's nothing more unspiritual than that, that phrase, but I hear it all the time. It makes people feel like big, like I'm, I'm good with God, but I don't really like the church. Well, That'd be like coming up to me and saying, I really like you, Brian, but I don't really like your wife. That, that's, what, that's what it sounds like to Jesus. This is a package deal. 
If you get Jesus, you get the church. You get the family. I'm with you, though, man. I'd rather have Jesus than the weird uncle. But you get the weird uncle, too. You say, I know those weird uncles. Listen, we're all kind of weird in here. We all kind of are imperfect. And Jesus is shaping us and molding us and working on us. And he says that he actually allows all of us to get in on that, to help one another, to chip away that which is us so that the only thing that remains is Jesus. He uses us for that. And so we come together and we love one another and we love one another and it's going to take time. Hebrews 10, 24 says, and I want, for those of you that don't want to be with the weird uncles and weird aunts and all that, this is what it says. Let us consider how we must spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. I've had some small groups I'm going to talk about in a moment that have changed my life. I've also had some small groups with people in the church where I lead that small group and I say, I'm never going back there again, only to go back there the next week. Because I come before God and I realize i got to love. If you, somebody told me this a long time ago, if you find the perfect church, don't join it. You will ruin it. We're all imperfect. We're all imperfect. We all have our problems. We all have things in our life that, that challenge us. And we all have different types of segments of our life where we say, I want, I want to go to a church that's like this. I want to go to a church that's like this. I want to, typically, we want to go to a church that's a lot like us. That like the music that we want. That look like us. That are the same color of skin is us, that have the same culture as us. And the reality is, Jesus wants us to love one another despite all those differences. He's giving us a new identity. He's the family. Let's just look at the family of God. Let me ask you, do you get along with everybody in your family? Parents, we love our kids. You always like your kid? Be honest. Kids, you're supposed to love your parents. You always like them. Sometimes it drives you crazy, some of the things they tell you to do and what they, but we're supposed to love one another. Let's expand it out. Christmas time. You love everybody that comes over Christmas? Are you glad to see some of your family members leave? Let's be honest. But we're family. We're in this together. We love one another. We encourage one another. And there is this, this thing in the Bible that we are actually supposed to be closer to our spiritual family than our, even our biological family. Jesus says that there will be a day when, when fathers and children will be separate, moms and children will be separate, husbands and wives will be separate based upon this, Jesus. Jesus. There will be people that will come to Christ and be close in Christ, and they will actually leave their biological family, and come to Christ. I know that sounds crazy, but this, it happens. Some of you in this room have been abandoned by your biological family because you are a Christian. They don't like you anymore. They think you're weird. They think that you are conservative or however, Christian, liberal, Christian, however you want to slice it. They've made you, they've segmented you, and they've cut you out of their family because of what you believe. And that's what Jesus is saying. But when you come together as family, we are to be family, the family of God, it says. And we come together and we meet together and we encourage one another. And in our church, what we do is we, we kind of call it this way. We boil it down very simply. We do two things. We meet together in two areas, and it's very simple. Large group, small group. We don't have a lot of meetings. I grew up, I'm 38 years of ministry. I am meetinged out. We don't have a lot of meetings. Because the more meetings we have as a church, the less you're out there with people that they are lost and need Christ. So we boil it down to very simple, simply this. We say we meet together in large group on Sunday, and we have small group. It's the same church. It's like two wings of the same plane. We gather together in small group, and we gather together in large group, and there are things we can do here that we don't do in small group, and there are things we do in small group that we don't do here. And that's kind of how it, it looks in Acts 5.42. It says, and every day 
in the temple. You think your small group meets a lot. Look at this. And every day, every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that Christ is Jesus. Could you imagine that? Every day they were gathered together. They couldn't get enough of Christ in community together. And they met together in the temple, a large group, and house to house. Some people ask me, what do you think about the house church? I think it's great. What do you think about churches meeting together on Sunday morning? I think it's great. Matter of fact, I think you should do both. Because there are things that you can do in small group that you cannot do in large group. There are, just from the dynamics of sociology, when, when you look at it, or educationally, if you talk to an educator, they would say the perfect size group is about five to seven. If you're a teacher, you want to get that group down to five to seven because the collaboration and the learning is, is so sweet in that group. Now, we don't use that as a rule. We kind of use it as a guideline. What we love to have is small groups somewhere in the neighborhood of three to about 12 to 15. But boy, when it's five to seven, when only five people show up, that's the, that seems to be the best nights. When it gets larger than that, you actually have a small church is what you have. And somebody will usually take the reins and run with that group. And the introverts will be looking at their watch, when can I get out of this room? So smaller is, 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 is best from all kinds of aspects. But so we, we, when we say small group, we actually mean small group. What do you do when it gets larger? We multiply. We multiplied a group just a few months ago. And I think you guys had, we had a midtown small group, young adults. Did you have 17 the other night? 17 young adults in your house. I don't, even, I don't even know how that's possible in your house. You moved the shop back. That's how you got them in, right? So, and then we're starting another co-ed group in Midtown in just a few weeks. So if you're interested, you can just put Midtown on your card. We're starting another small group there, a co-ed group. And if you're interested, you live somewhere in that neighborhood or you're looking for a group, it's going to be on Thursday night. So you can be a part of that. But the idea is to just continue to multiply and to continue to have large group settings. And then when the church has an opportunity, we actually multiply churches. So we're, we're making disciples, we're multiplying small groups, and we're multiplying churches. That's the goal. And then we'll do this, and we'll do this, and we'll do this. We'll see God's glory come to the city, and get this. Then we'll all go to heaven together. Sound good? That's it. That's our plan. And you know what? That was the plan in Acts. So it was something that they did on a regular basis. And lastly, loving one another is an eternal lifestyle. Ephesians speaks of the eternal purpose of God, and eternal means forever. And that's such a big term, eternal purpose of God. What is that? It's so big. We know this, though. Eternal means before time, during time, and after time. So whatever, whenever we hear the word eternal purpose, what is that? Here's what I do know. In God's sovereignty and God's grace, he's brought us into the eternal purpose. And he says that as the church emerges, the eternal purpose is actually being lived out. You are a part of the eternal purpose. But let's just look at how this eternal purpose, this, this Christ-centered community has expanded. Look at John 17, 24. Just a few verses later from John 15, this is what Jesus says. He's about ready to go to the cross. He is speaking to his heavenly Father, and he says some of the most beautiful words that you can ever hear from Jesus. He says, you love me before the foundations of the world. He's about ready to go to the cross. Saying to his father, you love me before the foundations of the world. How does Jesus do this? Fully God, but also fully man. He was loved by his father. He was loved. So before time, there was a small group. Who was in the small group before time? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That's a really good small group, by the way. And if you're by yourself, there's four. Think about that. You know what you're missing out when you miss time with God? You're missing out a small group with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You might want to jump into that small group. Jesus says, before the foundation of the world, Father, Holy Spirit, you both love me. There was Christ-centered community before time. Then, during time, there is community. 
Man is made, Genesis 1, 26, 27. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And then we go on and we find out that he does not want man to be alone. Why? Because aloneness and, and individualism is not God's purpose. 27 says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Male and female, he created them. The very foundation of society here on earth is man and woman, husband and wife, in community together. Well, there's five. That's a great small group. Agreement together. And really, he calls husband and wife to be one together. And then John 17, 20, my prayer, look at this, my prayer is not for them alone, talking about his disciples. In John 17, 20, here's what happens. Jesus prays for you. Before the cross, Jesus is thinking about you and me, and he says, I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they, who is they? You. They, it's you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. Wow. Jesus had you and me on his mind right there. The cross is a symbol of sin and payment for our sin, but it's also a symbol of reconciliation. He wants us to be one together. He didn't say just one um, that is this color or this culture, this tribe from this nation. No, no, no. Oneness means oneness, and we see that in Revelation 7, 9, and 10. Let's look forward to this. This is incredible. And then I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and the Lamb. You see, this is all moving somewhere. And here's the thing. I kind of want to get in on that now. I don't want to wait till the end. I look at this room. There's different nationalities here. There's different skin colors in this room. A few years ago, I went to Ghana. And a few weeks ago, I get to meet my sister from Ghana, right? We're worshiping here. I've been to Ghana. Those worship services are a lot longer there, by the way. About an hour in, they're starting to preach. But we're worshiping together. Why wait till the very end? Why not do it now? Sometimes, you know, God calls us to go to the ends of the earth, and it's not just to take his message there, which is by far one of the reasons. I think sometimes he wants us to go there so that we can experience his glory and to be together. I want to get in on it now. Christ-centered community is not just for white people or black people or Hispanic people. He wants us all to be together. A church should look more like their community. Do you know that that schools look 20 times more like their community than churches? Schools are ahead of this. The church should be the cutting edge of being together. In Christ-centered community. He's bringing us all together. I, I end with this. Uh, in, in 1993, my daughter, Phoenix, was born premature. Uh, she almost died. She was in a, a little neonatal unit. I remember 25 days after her birth, the doctor told me on a Sunday morning that she was going to make it. We're having church that morning. It was uh, Christmas and we're worshiping God, and uh, we just sing that song, Give Thanks. And I just wept as I led worship because my daughter was saved. My daughter was going to make it. Fast forward to 2010. I'm on a mission trip in Jakarta, Indonesia. Some young people take me to a young adult small group. And it was in a 90% radical Muslim area. Security guard was there. He had come to know Christ a few months earlier. He was watching the door to make sure we were going to be okay. Numerous people, numerous groups had been killed over the last few years meeting together in that area. So, man, I'm, I'm like, wow, <laughs> is, this, is gonna, this is going to be an unusual small group. I'm watching that door. And as I get in, they're worshiping God in their own language. 
And about 10 minutes in, the facilitator is leading, and a couple walks over. She's, she's expecting, and she's bawling, and they go to the corner of the room. And as we're singing and worshiping, the facilitator begins to say, do you have a word for this person or this person? It was very, it wasn't weird or anything like that. It was just edifying one another. And he looks at me and he says, Pastor Brian, do you have a word for my sister over here? And I did. As we were worshiping, I sensed that she was experiencing the same thing and her baby was experiencing the same thing and my daughter was experiencing years later or earlier. And I said these words, I heard from God, you are going to be okay. You're going to be okay. They both <laughs> smiled and acknowledged the fact that I was encouraging them. And we continued on worshiping. The group did not know this. Only God knew this, and I knew this. They began to sing, give thanks. In Indonesian. But I heard the tune. I'm like, that's give thanks. No joke. As real as it can be. They changed from singing in Indonesian to singing in English. For me. He didn't know English. God knows English. The Spirit knows English. You look at that and you say, is that how small groups are all the time? Not at all. But sometimes they are. Sometimes. Let me just kind of break this down. For one, they were risking their lives to be there. Do you risk your life to be there? Maybe we should risk maybe one less movie on Netflix or one less this event or that event to be there. They're risking it all. Maybe we should risk some of our laziness and get involved and be there in small group. And then the facilitator was willing to allow God to move. He wasn't there to preach. He was there to facilitate what was going on. The couple was willing to be there even though their child was experiencing poor health. I can't tell you how many times I've heard people say, I can't go to a small group. I've got a headache tonight. I get it. Sometimes we have headaches. Well, not every other week. Come on. I'm just telling you. The gospel is moving around the world, but it is a different world in other places that are risking it all to be there. This, this, this couple was over there, and they were in. And I'm not going to just toot my own horn, but I can tell you this. I did step into it, and I did hear from God. I didn't have to be there. I thought about leaving. But I was there as well. I did take a plane ticket to get there. I was in. When you look at all those dimensions, it's not about small group, guys. It's about Christ. Jesus is waiting for people to come and to love one another. Not just spend time with him, but to spend time in community. I can tell you time and time and time and time and time again of times where I've experienced Christ in community. But that one event stood out because there was no doubt that group loved one another. There was one other aspect of that night that I still can't figure out completely. The love in that room allowed this group to move from singing one language to hearing from God and singing another. And I, that has never happened in my life. That's Acts 2 stuff, guys. If you ever read Acts 2 and you're like, that doesn't happen now, it does. But we got to be all in. Not everybody here is interested in experiencing that. My prayer is that you will someday be all in. But wouldn't it be something is if we put up our sails and we meet in community and we love one another and God decides in his sovereignty and in his might and in his power to move once again? Would you be in for that? Would you be in for what, what God could do through us? Where people would say, wow, God was in the midst of them. I am. Here's... Here's the question for you. Number one, where in your life do you experience Christ-centered community? Maybe not like what I experienced in Indonesia. Obviously, that's, that's, a, that's a crazy story that I've never experienced before. But I have experienced Christ in community numerous times. Do you have 
a community where you say Christ is the center of that community. Christ is the center of that community. If you don't, we'd love to help you get involved in one. We have a next steps table. We can help you do that. Here's another thing. Is there somebody in your life that needs the love of Christ and they are on your heart right now? You, it could be a visit. It could be they're sick. It could be a neighbor that you haven't seen for a few weeks and you just need to go over and just love on them. Is there anybody in this church where you say, you know what? God has told me to visit with that person. God has told me to go out and have coffee with that person. I need to do that. Is there somebody like that in your life? This is more than a small group message. This is loving one another. There's one more group here. And you're hearing this and you're going, I don't even think I know Jesus. I'd love to be introduced to Jesus. I would love to talk to you. And I'm going to be at the next steps table right after we're done here. And I'm going to go there and I'll meet with you. And there'll be other people there. And we would love to pray with you if you want to know Jesus Christ. Let me pray with you right now. Dear Father, we thank you for this time we've had to talk about your love. Lord, there's all kinds of different aspects we've, we've talked about. But Lord, I pray that you will put it on the heart of somebody here today. If they need to be in a community where you are the center, Lord, that they would step out and take a step of faith and hang out at somebody's house, as crazy as that sounds in our culture. A complete stranger. But Lord, we pray that happens. And others, maybe in this room, that, that maybe you put on their heart just to go to lunch with somebody. Just to spend time with them and to love on them. And Lord, I pray for those that are here today that do not know you, that they would take that step of faith and begin a relationship with you, Jesus. We pray this in your son's name.